I am Anna Seewald and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about personal development in the context of parenting, where I explore how you can find more calm, connection and joy in parenting through the process of self-discovery and inner growth with a trauma-informed lens. Do you have a hard time saying no to people? Do you often sacrifice your own needs to accommodate other people? Do you have a hard time setting boundaries? Are you unhappy in your relationship and unable to leave? Then you might be in a codependent relationship or you might be a codependent and you might be interested in today's topic, codependency. This term codependency was coined a few decades ago in the context of Alcoholics Anonymous to acknowledge and support partners of alcoholics who were intertwined in the destructive lives of those they loved. But today it has a different meaning. And on the podcast, we are exploring what is codependency? What are the symptoms of codependency? What's the origin of codependency? How does shame play a part in codependency? How does codependency and shame affect relationships? And of course, we are talking about recovery. What are some of the steps required for healing? My special guest today is Darlene Lancer. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist, sought-after speaker, and author on relationships and codependency. Her books include Conquering Shame and Codependency, Eight Steps to Freeing the True You, and Codependency for Dummies. And she's written several e-books, including 10 Steps to Self-Esteem, how to speak your mind, become assertive, and set limits, dealing with a narcissist, eight steps to raise self-esteem, and many more. They are available on Amazon, other online booksellers, and of course, on her website, whatiscodependency.com. You can connect with her on social media. She is on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and I will have links to all of her social accounts. During our interview, Darlene references a few of her articles, and of course, I will have links to those as well. Human relationships are complex, complicated, and interesting. Please enjoy this eye-opening interview with Darlene Lancer. Darlene, welcome to Authentic Parenting. I am so delighted and honored to have you on the podcast. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I really enjoy sharing uh, my knowledge and research with a wider audience, and uh, I always welcome the opportunity. Yes, this is an interesting, intriguing topic for me and for many people. You know, nobody wants to admit or they don't know that they're codependents. But once you read a little bit, you know, it's like, wow, I am codependent. So I want to begin by asking you to first define what codependency is. Well, codependency, uh, in my mind, is a disorder of the self. Uh, So it doesn't matter if you're in a relationship or out of a relationship. It's uh, when your thinking and behavior revolves around something external to you, which could include uh, a process addiction like gambling or sex addiction, shopping, work, or a substance, food, drugs, alcohol, or a person. So rather than responding to your internal cues, which would be healthy, you're focused on your locus of control is the um, a word, term of art, like it's outside of yourself. Mm. And what are some 
other definitions that are, are out there that you know of. Um, I, I like your definition. It resonates with me and with the whole uh, authentic parenting notion. Since Okay, you well, know, some, like Melody Beatty, who <laughs> was one of the first people to write a popular book about codependency, uh, framed it in terms of relationships, like when you're controlled by somebody else's behavior. I see it more as starting from the inside and because even if you're not in a relationship, people have this problem of uh, they may not get as addicted to a person that way, but there's still their self-esteem, their behavior, they're still concerned about what people think. And as soon as they get close to somebody, they have these intimacy issues. Uh, that's And then there was a man named Subby, who was a researcher, and he thought it, he defined it in terms of uh, developmental psychology and the family, dysfunctional family. He said it was the result of being exposed to oppressive rules. So if you had rigid or oppressive rules or abuse in your childhood, that that would lead to codependency. But You know, I have clients and people who didn't grow up in an abusive home, but there are other ways you could have someone, a parent that's like overly involved with you and is codependent themselves. And so that the the baby, it starts even in infancy, starts adapting to the mother, especially if she's not attuned to the infant's needs and feelings. So the baby to survive starts adapting to the parent. And then I'm more in line with uh, Bradshaw and some of the other, some other writers who look at it more as uh, an illness of a lost self. So I go into all this in, in codependency for dummies, but that it's really a loss of connection, alienation from your real self. And that's what recovery is about, recovering, reclaiming who you are and individuating, which is a natural process. Hopefully it's mostly, it's lifelong, but it's mostly achieved once you read, uh, you arrive at adulthood, but uh, with your codependence until they get into recovery, it's stunted because they're not owning their own perceptions, their own opinions, their own feelings, uh, their own needs. Those are usually repressed or suppressed in codependence. Repression is when you, it's unconsciously, you're out of touch with it. It's like totally in denial and suppressed is when you consciously make a decision to sacrifice your needs or put aside your feelings to get along in a relationship. Mm. How can someone know if they are codependent? In other words, what are some of the symptoms? And and of course, you spoke about it a little bit already, but what are the main characteristics of codependency? Well, a good question because the hallmark of all addictions, including codependency, is denial. So most people who are codependent are in denial. They may say, I really know somebody who needs your book, and I'm going to buy your book for them, and what can I do to help them? (laughs) And it's all about somebody else. They're in a relationship with an addict. They want to help, and they think, and this was also my own experience, that I thought I didn't have any problems. It was only, you know, the other person who needed help. If only they would shape up. So that's a, that's a key. If you're in an abusive relationship, not for a few months, but if you're staying in an abusive relationship, probably a good chance that you're codependent. Uh, if you're trying to rescue somebody else, you're focused on getting somebody else sober or get them to uh, make a living or achieve a career goal or something. You're, you're trying to help somebody else, bailing them out of jail. 
I've had clients who can't afford the therapy because they spend it getting their client, their their boyfriend or their spouse, bailing him out of jail. So mm. that's like that's kind of frustrating because it's classic codependent codependency. So that's those are some. If you have intimacy issues and you feel uncomfortable being close, if you have trouble saying no and setting limits, whether it's to somebody who's abusive or somebody who just is always asking you for favors, complying, you're overly accommodating. With, you know, having sex when you don't want to, babysitting for someone you don't want to, doing favors for people, even accepting invitations you don't want to accept, even if it's a good thing, it doesn't have to be. You just can't set boundaries with abuse. So dysfunctional communication, dysfunctional boundaries, these are all denial. These are all symptoms of codependency, problems with intimacy, as I mentioned. And the core symptom is shame. So in America, people don't talk much about shame. It's more commonly openly discussed in Asia and the Middle East, even South America more collectivist cultures. And it's so important as a cornerstone of codependency that I wrote a book, Conquering Shame and Codependency, that goes deeper. It's like a graduate level maybe of codependency for dummies. Once you identify codependency and you want to get into the deeper roots. So a lot, a lot of people are very aware that they feel less than others and they never feel good enough some people cover it up with perfectionism. They're always trying to be perfect. They don't realize that underneath it's, they're doing that because they want to seem flawless because it would be so horrific if anybody knew that they were just average or made mistakes or were just, you know, flawed human beings as we all are. And other people act arrogant and they think there's nothing wrong with them that other people are not as smart or not as whatever. So they, their shame is projected outward. It's typical someone wants to rescue someone else, even just someone who's depressed. Um, if they only, only they would get their act together, then they'd be happy. So shame is not so commonly thought about, talked about in our, in Western culture, guilt, is usually, but if you have guilt that's irrational and you can't get over something, it's probably because there's shame underneath. Because shame will cause fear and it'll cause anxiety and it'll cause guilt. And um, the most prominent feature is anxiety. So a lot of people with anxiety don't realize that they have shame, but they're anxious about looking foolish, making mistakes, you know, not being liked in a group or on a date, or they're always concerned about their appearance, their clothes, their hair, their weight. Um, for a woman more, her bodily size and, and shape. And for a man, it might be more his sexual performance, his strength, you know, showing any sign of weakness, things like that. So the anxiety is a clue to shame and sh Shame is a core feature of codependency. Mm -hmm. So those are some key ways that it might come up. And why do you think we in the West are not so eager to look at shame or talk about shame? Well, in, in your opinion, I mean, I do. do I don't know. Uh, That's more of a sociological uh, yes. <laughs> a question that I haven't researched. Um, but I will say it's, uh, the, the emphasis on guilt has mm -hmm. to do with uh, religion. Mm. So Catholicism and Puritanical, you, you know, in the United States was really founded on the Puritans coming over here from England. And there was a lot of the Calvinism and Puritanism. It was all uh, focused on, you know, being sinning and, and um, you know, being righteous and, and people were, made to feel guilty in order to correct their behavior. There was some shaming too, but 
I've worked with people from the Middle East, from Russia, from Latin America, and the shaming is very, and Asia, very prominent. It's like you're shaming the family and it's talked about. You are shamed to your whole, I had a client from Russia and the school put up a banner shaming her publicly. Yes, I grew up in the Soviet Union. I can attest to that. Yes, I, okay. grew, up, I, I grew up in that kind of culture. I uh, remember publicly we had this public shaming. Um, even there is an expression, right? When you do something wrong, quote unquote, as a child, or people will say, shame on you. And, mm-hmm. and so it's very, very prominent. Yes, uh, it's out there. This shame yeah, is it's, it's just horrifying to think of that. And then in uh, there's studies, uh, statistics in, I think it's in South Korea, if a student doesn't do well on their college entrance exams, uh, which is very important to the family and for a lot of different reasons, uh, they often commit suicide. Yes, I, I don't want to say often, but the uh, statistically high number yes, of students yeah. get so worked up about performing well on their um, tests, so performance anxiety, whether it's for sex or, or you know, in school, that indicates a big fear of shame. And then I had a client from Mexico who was didn't do well on a test in school because of problems at home that were never addressed. And so she was made to wear a dunce cap and sit in front of the Mm. classroom. And and that that all the students were encouraged to shame her as being stupid. So that's certainly not going to... So the difference with shame makes you feel irredeemable and makes you want to hide. Guilt at least makes you want to make amends and improve yourself. Like there's an avenue. It's about your behavior. Okay, Maybe I could study harder. Maybe I can achieve, be a better person. So it it does, it's, it has a better outcome, except a lot of times when it's irrational guilt, there's shame underneath that. So you're still going to get stuck in the shame. I know. But it has to do, I think, with the culture and the family, the, the religion plays a big part of it. So... I guess like in Catholic countries or like it's also used, shame is used to manipulate and control. Yes. Whether it's China or whether mm-hmm. it's in the Soviet Union, it's to control the masses. So. And it's like you're responsible, you're portraying everything. To, if you are the child, I remember this. They can shame you. Uh, how dare you bring our family's name, our family's reputation as if you're carrying this whole burden on you. That's right. The uh, same in, in the Far East, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, I, part of it has to do with the collectivist culture mm-hmm, where family mm-hmm. and tradition, that's very important. So in the West, it's more, the individual is more important. So even in Buddhism, which is not based on like shame like that, but the family structure is all the family, your ancestors, you're a representative of the family. You take care of your ancestors. And in the West, it's more you're an individual. And the humanistic movement in the early 20th century emphasized that even more, like the individuals. You know, your inner self is more important than the family. You're supposed to leave the family, free yourself of the family. And your behavior reflects on you. It doesn't reflect on your whole family. So there's cultural, socio, political, and religious ideas and ideology that go into that. Mm. Do you think um, those of us who are in helping professions, like teachers, nurses, therapists, and such, there's a large number of us that are codependent? That's why we choose those professions? More than likely, yes. Yes. Uh, It often comes from a role in maybe a natural empathic ability or personality. Plus it's often a role in the family. Mm. You're taking care of a parentified. You have to, 
you know, make meals for and, and raise your younger siblings, or you have a parent that is immature and you have to take care of your parent in some way or sick. So sometimes that behavior is molded in your family. So the roots of codependency are always in our childhood. It's beyond your childhood because it's transgenerational. If you have a codependent parent, mm -hmm. you'll be codependent because your parent is going to need you to support their self-esteem. Mm -hmm. They may not be attuned. They're going to be overreactive to you. They're going to need you to love them. They won't be able to tolerate when their child is angry at them. Mm, there is so, emo also okay. emotional blackmailing sometimes. I, I, I see that too. Parents emotionally blackmailing their children. Well, it could be the opposite. They indulge their children. Mm. They just always want to keep them happy so that they will love them back. You know? So a narcissist may be, you know, narcissists are codependent too in, in, my, in my thinking because they're so dependent on other people. Mm. How else can um, this codependency sort of grow in, in a parent-child relationship? As, as I am listening, as I've been reading and immersed in, the, in this topic uh, in, in preparation of this interview, of course, I'm a mother and, and I keep thinking, am I screwing up my child? Am I making her codependent in what ways, right? And I am examining my own parenting. How can well, I be aware of not yeah. doing that? The best way to, it, uh, one of the core components of recovery is building your self-esteem. So everybody writes and talks about building their children's self-esteem. And some parents say, oh, you're so wonderful and you're so special. That is not helpful. It's counterproductive. The best way to build your child's self-esteem and be a better parent is to raise your own self-esteem. So to the extent you're not reactive, to the extent you have something going on in your life other than just being a parent, so you're not living th for and through your children, to have a strong marriage, because a lot of times the parenting sacrifice get, suffers and is sacrificed when there isn't a strong bond between the parents. So that's one of the most important things, mm. that you're on the same page with your husband, that your intimacy needs are met with your husband, that you are nurturing yourself. A lot of times parents don't realize they get so agitated and frustrated with their children, especially a lot of young children, when they're not taking care of themselves. Now, I know it's hard because there's only so many hours in the day, but it means you know, talking to friends about adult things, maybe going to the gym, uh, meditating, having a creative project, going out in nature, doing something, whatever that means to you, it's going to fill you up. Otherwise, you have nothing to give. And you're going to overreact, whether it's to your husband or to your child. So self-care is the other pillar of Recovery and building self-esteem, learning how to care for yourself. If you didn't have a parent that could do that, you don't know how. In order to nurture your children, you have to nurture yourself. You have nothing to give if your cup is empty. Just like on a plane, the stewardess will say uh, to mothers, if the plane goes down, put the oxygen mask on yourself first before your child you can't help your child if you're suffocating. Mm. Uh, another question. Um, when someone is codependent, do they develop codependent relationships uh, in general? Or is it with a particular person in a particular <clears throat> context? Um, do, do you know what I mean? Yes. Generally, the codependency is in the self. So... It will come out in different ways, but with some people, it's predominantly like a parent-child situation or with a spouse, and sometimes it's universal. 
So sometimes it's a little hard, tricky for me to know because they may not be talking about a problem. They think they don't have a problem with their spouse or something. It's only with their parent or only with their child. But when you start digging deeper, you see that there's some, even though they think they're getting along, and it doesn't necessarily, when you're codependent, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're fighting. There's some codependent marriages where they just like two peas in a pod and they're very happy. I know a couple like that, a very functional. Yeah. Is that a good yeah. word to use, functional codependent? Yeah, yeah. It works for them. I had, you know, this is a generational issue too, but my, my parents had friends uh, a couple, and he was a doctor and she called him father or something. <laughs> he <laughs> called her mother and she was totally compliant with her husband who she idealized, but it worked. And they, they were in the age, uh, uh, old age home together in their nineties, you know, happy as two, what do they call it? In a clam <laughs> shell, but um, it worked for them. So then when so, is it unhealthy? Well, I think that's, you have to be careful when you say it's healthy or unhealthy. Oh, because okay. Because then you're, okay. then you're putting on certain, again, like, I'm not going to say uh, marriage, uh, relation, family structure in China, in the Middle East is unhealthy. I would be imposing like Western standards. But when they, those children immigrate to the U.S., or their parents immigrate and they were born here, there was tremendous conflict because there's two different value systems. They want to be individuals and the parents think they have to be comply to the family standards and the family comes first and all of the things you talked about. And it's a real struggle for the first generation Americans. So, I, I know couples that their marriage works, but they live in separate houses. They live in separate cities. They even live in separate countries. You could say they have intimacy issues, which they do, <laughs> but it, it works for them. Mm. They Can, probably wouldn't, yeah. couldn't stay married if they lived in, under the same roof. Oh, I see. So this may be a silly question, but I'm, I'm not sure. So in a, a couple, uh, in a couple, do two parties have to be sort of codependent or one is codependent and the other one may not be? Let's say. I always um, say it takes two. It takes two. So, so, so let's one, say, for instance, mm -hmm. yeah, let's say, for example, a husband's always working mm -hmm. and his mm -hmm. wife is very like needy of him and uh, lonely and thinks he's a problem and he seems very independent. Mm -hmm. I have a blog on the dance of intimacy. Well, he's in denial of his needs for connection and she's in denial of her needs for autonomy. So together they're unhappy, but they make a whole kind of they're each other's shadow. So maybe he's addicted not to a drug, but to work. And he's afraid to be vulnerable and to ask for his needs. There was a movie years ago called the doctor and there's was this guy is a brain surgeon and all and he's actually I think he's having an affair and his wife is lonely and pining for him and he's doesn't care so much about his marriage and then he gets of all things brain cancer mm. and he's a terrified of dying and the story evolves and how he's finally it's very hard for him to finally turn to his wife and say, I need you. So, and that was a turning point in him to get, to write a system that was totally out of balance. So if the system is like out of balance, it's eventually going to, you know, try to write itself. There'll be enough pain in it where somebody's going to leave or insist on changes because mm -hmm. it's out of balance. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know you speak about that, you know, you started doing this work because of your own 
a codependency issue mm -hmm. and, and you went through a recovery. And I know in the past life, you've been an attorney, right? You've practiced for about 20 years, I believe. Yeah. Um, and uh, so how was your upbringing, if you don't mind me asking, in terms of uh, this codependency patterns forming? Sure. Uh, well, I, I'm happy to share. I just want to clarify my last answer, and that was that this husband that didn't need his wife, mm -hmm. he was even though he seemed independent, he's codependent because he's uh, he's not he's not divorcing her. By the way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he wants her around, but uh, he's in denial of his needs. Just like that's a very typical symptom of co codependency. So, and he could be controlling. That's another form of, you know, control is a big issue of controlling his feelings. That's a big symptom of codependency, by the way, is control. I, I, either, um, I heard you say either they control themselves, their thoughts, their behavior, their feelings, or they control the other person, right? Right. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's, I, I call it like soft control. It's caretaking. I'm trying to fix you. I'm trying to help you. I'm giving you advice. Versus maybe a narcissist who says, you know, what's wrong with you? Go get a haircut. You don't dress right. Oh, bring me food. You have to do this. They're ordering you around like a slave or whatever. So that it could be over. It could be covert. It could be, you know, direct. And it could be kind of in a, in a soft way, gentle way. I once dated a man who would criticize me, but it would be in such a loving way. <laughs> it took me a way to a little bit to realize I was constantly being like judged and criticized, but it was always like in framed in a loving tone of voice and it would make him so much happier. And <laughs> okay. So in terms of my childhood, mm -hmm. I had a very controlling mother who was a narcissist and my father was a workaholic. So although they would say that they were happy, from my vantage point, I was a middle child and I think I was like picking up a lot of the emotional tension in the family where other siblings weren't. And I could feel that there, I, I knew that my mother wasn't happy with that. And I knew my father, would, my mother was very critical. So that made me unhappy that I'm seeing this unhappiness I would say, you know, I'd watch these family sitcoms, uh, dramas that they used to have on TV in the 50s, and there were always these happy families. It's not like that today, but it was always like Leave it to Beaver and Father's know, Knows Best. And I'd say, well, why don't you and Daddy hug <laughs> when Daddy comes home from work, you know? And uh, so I didn't see a lot of affection between my parents, which bothered me. And uh, my mother was uh, trying to live through me. So she was very controlling. She was like generous and trying to make me into kind of her, the, everything that she wanted. So it wasn't as cruel as some narcissistic mothers are, but it was, you know, I had to be a lady and I, she wanted me to dress a certain way and talk a certain way and question the things that I like to do if it wasn't her idea, rather than helping a child be who they are and encourage. I wanted to be a dancer and she didn't want me to do that. I wanted to be a psychiatrist when I was a teenager. And she says, oh, you don't want to do that. You know, and so she would try to talk me out of whatever I wanted to do. So I knew she wanted my brother. She thought my, one of my brothers would have been a great lawyer. He was a prof professor. So I, just, I thought, well, I'm, I, I'm as smart as my brothers. I'll go be a lawyer. I didn't realize that until years later. I was very unhappy in my work. And I'm in therapy. And just like, wasn't anything that the therapist said. I don't know how it just popped into mind. I realized I became a lawyer to get the respect of, of my mother. Because she always said, well, you don't need a profession. You'll just marry somebody, you know. So that was also kind of an old a 50s idea. You marry well. And so there's a lot of chauvinism in my family. So 
my brothers, they were 10 and eight years older. They were going to be the stars, you know, they were the, the apple of my mother's eye and they were going to get be, and they were very successful in professions. And when I decided to go to law school, it was like shocked to everybody. Like, why would you want to go to law school? And then when I did become a lawyer, it was not, uh, it was never enough for my mother. She'd say, well, you should be a judge. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's I was an entertainment lawyer. It's, yeah, never pardon me? For, it's never enough for parents. I, I well, know. for a narcissist, particularly. <laughs> and then I was an entertainment lawyer and working in Holland. She says, well, you really should be an agent. Mm. You know, so <laughs> it was always something else. And then when I finally decided I want to be a therapist, I said, why would you want to be a therapist? You're going to make a lot more money as a lawyer, <laughs> <laughs> which is true, but uh, didn't matter. So. Yes. And, and then I, I, I know you married someone uh, who had addiction issues and you were covering for him. Is that true, right? Yes, I married an alcoholic mm-hmm. who also had mental health issues. W- were you uh, and, a therapist? And I was like sacrificed. No, no. Mm-hmm. I was doing therapy before I went. To, I thought I might as well make this a profession because then I remembered, oh, I wanted to be a shrink when I was a kid. So here I was doing it, trying to do it with my husband, but I didn't have any training and I was sacrificing myself and I wasn't, I didn't aware, I wasn't aware, excuse me, I was sacrificing myself because I had denied my needs and that was from childhood. I had learned to deny my needs, to deny my feelings. Yes, of course, if if a child's feelings are not welcomed or validated um, in a parent-child relationship, they learn to shut down those feelings or mistrust them completely. That's right. My my feelings were shamed. So you asked about dysfunctional marriage, and I gave you examples of this, you know, you could call them dysfunctional. You know, whatever works for the couple. But when you bring children into it... Mm -hmm into a dysfunctional marriage, there's going to be dysfunction in the family as a family unit. So say more about uh, this a little bit. Yes. Yeah. So if you have a parent, let's say a parent is um, very controlling and the wife goes along with it. Well, maybe that'll last, you know, a lifetime or something in that marriage, but that's going to spill over to the children and being controlling of the children. And uh, if there's, and then that sets up a role model, then sometimes an older sibling will then, if they've been abused or controlled, they're gonna do that with their younger siblings. In fact, in my own family, I'm publishing a blog. Well, actually it's a peer review article coming out in a therapy journal uh, later this month in California uh, called the hidden epidemic, sibling abuse. So uh, my older brothers that I mentioned would kind of order me around, not in a mean way, and I was very happy to comply because I just wanted their attention. But, uh, you know, sometimes I objected, and I and at this point then I had a younger sister. And I complained to my mother. I said, you know, they're always bossing me around. And she said, well, now you have a younger sister to boss around. So mm-hmm. you can see the mentality that was, you know, from a narcissist's point of view, that's perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. So there was no, the parents were intervening to stop sibling. I see a lot of clients who the abuse didn't come from their parents. It came from a sibling, an older sibling, usually on a younger. And the worst is an older male on a younger female. Sometimes there's sexual abuse there. But I've had uh, male clients who are beaten up by their, and and teased, humiliated by older brothers. It starts often with the parents. If they're not getting enough attention, if they're being shamed or humiliated or controlled by a parent, then it's going to spill over to the children. 
Um, I'm glad you're speaking about this and I, I'm curious to read the blog post and I will definitely promote it in our Facebook group mm-hmm. and put it in the show notes as I have spoken about sibling abuse on this podcast before, just to remind our listeners that we did an episode called Sibling Rivalry, How to Raise Friends for Life. In that episode, you know, I also talk about sibling abuse, which is not talked about in our culture, in our society very much, but it does exist and, and it should be brought to the surface. And all this public bullying mm-hmm. that's now condoned and people complain about it in school. Mm-hmm. Well, the bullies, it, they've been bullied at home. And so now they're doing it at school. Absolutely. And parents yeah. just dismiss it as sibling rivalry. But uh, some rivalry is like a friendly competition. There's goodwill. There's not like shaming and humiliation, that teasing. Even, you know, my brothers would tickle me. Mm-hmm. Until I was couldn't breathe, and they did it lovingly. You know, they didn't know better. That that's abuse. Yeah, that's violating your, your body space, right? That's right, and it teaches also learned helplessness. And then, to my horror, I was telling my sister about. It. She says, "Well, you tickled me too." <laughs> I had no memory of this, but I was just doing. This is what happens. I was doing what was done to me. Did your mom have a similar type of relationship with her boys or it was just a, uh, because you were daughters? No, it's very different. Same sex. And I wrote a blog on daughters mm-hmm. of narcissistic mothers mm-hmm. and next month, and I have a blog, sons of narcissistic fathers. And I had so many men writing me, well, why don't you write a blog about my mother was narcissist, sons of narcissistic mothers. And that's coming out next month. Mm. So oh, I don't yeah. want to like go into that's a whole different yes. topic. I but, will. Uh, it's very different. I will share those as 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 time goes by. I will keep my eyes on on your posts and 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 share them. I'm, I'm but quite- in general, if you have a narcissistic parent, mm-hmm. it's going to mm-hmm. create codependency and damage the children, whether it's a male or female. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't and, matter if it's the same sex um, child. Well, how it how it shows up is different. Mm-hmm. But, um, well, even in my own family, I was saying how my mother would idealize my her sons. And then, but there's reasons in her history, which I don't want to get into all that, uh, why she would do that and want to live through, live through me. And also any anger she had at her mother would be projected onto me. So as, as a girl... So she'd want to live through me. She's not going to live. I mean, sometimes a mother will want to live through her sons too, especially if she doesn't have daughters. But then the narcissism affects the parenting. Doesn't matter if you're a male or a female. Yes, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it just speaks to me about boundaries, lack of lack of boundaries, right? Where uh, where one person begins and ends, where the other begins and ends. So those boundaries are very loose, violated, and meshed and, and fluid. It, uh, it's very interesting. When my mother was dying in the last few days of her life, she started to see me as separate. Interesting. <laughs> How so? She, well, I don't know. I could just give you some examples. Like Mm -hmm. she would always wear a lot of, um, all the years I knew her. I mean, I never saw her without nail polish. And I said to her, well, it it discolors my nails. Mm -hmm. And she said, really, it doesn't discolor mine. And she said that, that's just was one example. In the past, it would be, like what's wrong with you? <laughs> but it was she. Her her tone of voice was different. Like curious. Oh, like we're different. Wow. And there were a couple other things she said. Like, oh, that's interesting. Versus, I'm right and you're wrong. What's there's something wrong with you? Wow. I guess she didn't have the stamina to to keep up with that. Uh, inauthentic self um you know she used to buy me wool dresses that i didn't mm. even like and want to wear and i would be so uncomfortable in them and say they itch and she'd say 
you're too sensitive. <laughs> yeah, your skin is too dry. <laughs> you're like, and didn't give me, but she'd still buy me the wool dresses, you know. And it was only till maybe 10 years ago, I had did some allergy testing for something else, actually. It was my cat. <laughs> but I found out that I was allergic to wool. Oh, my gosh. So, and I can't. If it's very soft cashmere, I can wear it. I have sometimes I have to wear a t-shirt underneath. But um, yeah, I do have sensitive skin, but it's not the skin; it's, it's <laughs> the allergy. But so, let me ask you a question: When you were a child, did you stand up to her? Um, did did it occur oh, no, to you? Oh no, that was punished. Oh, that was punished. Anger was punished, and so that was very disabling. So there's a. Um, Melanie Klein is a famous psychoanalyst mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. mid-20th century. And she writes metaphorically, the baby must be able to bite the mother's breast. So that's a metaphor that the mother has to be able to tolerate rejection and anger of a, of a child. And a narcissist can't do that. If you have to allow your child to have their anger. So yeah. it doesn't mean sometimes you don't set boundaries and say, you know, go to your room until you, you're not going to break things and things like that. But you don't withhold love and shame the child for their anger. You say, I understand you're really disappointed. It's really it's frustrating when you can't do what you want to do. You, you mirror their upset feelings. You don't make them wrong. So I was punished for... Uh, standing up to, and that disabled me in terms of setting boundaries. Even if I was in an abusive situation, I was, didn't have access. When I first, before I started going to al meetings, I would notice that I might have this delayed reaction with anger. Like I might get angry at something that happened a week ago mm. or two weeks And then eventually it got to real time, but I didn't have the words. I didn't know what to say. And, you know, so gradually it became, I got connected to myself. Because those, those things we learn, right, when we are children, if you weren't, if you didn't learn, how could you have the skills? That's right. Well, so one of the, Most important, you know, I wrote, early on, I wrote two ebooks, How to Speak Your Mind, Become Assertive and Set Limits, and 10 Steps to Self-Esteem, The Ultimate Guide to Stop Self-Criticism. Because how we talk to ourselves, your parents, whether they shamed you or not, could be dead, and, but you've internalized those voices um, coming from shame. So how we talk to ourselves is crucial. And that book is just a, a brief handbook with exercises you could do one week at a time to start changing that. And the other one is how to be assertive. And when you are more assertive, it raises your self-esteem. Setting boundaries is key. That's kind of the graduate. Actually, my blog today on Facebook is, I say it's like the graduate course of assertiveness is setting boundaries. Because first you have to learn how to, you know, sit, take a position and and speak your mind and be honest and express your feelings, and then setting boundaries is takes more courage and more skill. But setting boundaries raises your self esteem, and people can assess unconsciously. They don't usually do this consciously, they can assess your self-esteem by how you talk. So if you go on a job interview and you aren't direct and you obfuscate or you don't sound authentic, you sound rehearsed, all these things, it shows your self-esteem. It shows in how you communicate. Whether you make eye contact, which is a form of communication, your posture is a form of communication. So people could tell pretty quickly 
what your self-esteem is. And even when you're dating, people will gravitate or not to you based on how you communicate. So mm-hmm. it's really important. And, and improving your communication empowers you. When you say keep accommodating people, you're going to build resentments. You're going to be angry at yourself. You're going to end up getting depressed if it keeps on, not getting your needs met. You'll be angry at the person. But it's such a mind-opening experience to set a boundary and then just walk away from the situation and never think about it again. So this is one of the reasons like codependents ruminate over things and hold on to resentments is because they're not setting boundaries. And it doesn't have to be mean or cruel in any way. You can do it very lovingly. But now I forgot your question. <laughs> no, but, your but question? it's but it's, it's it's interesting. I mean, these are all things that we learn or supposed to learn in parent child relationships, right? Um Parents supposed to set firm and loving limits with, with loving with, lovingly is the key. Yeah, lo- what, loving said, is key. <laughs> what did you say? I started off talking about Melanie Klein. What was the question about I, anger? It, to tell you the truth, okay. I forgot it too because this topic <laughs> is so rich and my mind is on on fire. I want to ask you different other questions. And of course, I want to talk about recovery, your own and how to recover in general from uh, codependency. You're, you're, you're such a gold mine uh, of, uh, of this topic and resources that I'm, I'm just like enchanted and listening. It's, it's very, um, and I forgot my question. So, and I'm also thinking about my own parenting as you're describing certain situations. <laughs> Try not to. <laughs> Try to focus. I tell in my book, Conquering Shame and Codependency, which is very deep and rich. In fact, people say I have to read it like a sentence at a time. And that's actually better. You can read it through once and then go back and think about, oh, do I do that? Did this happen to me? But there's a pitfall for parents because they start thinking, oh, am I shaming my children? How good a parent am I? And I I say, just try to focus on yourself and your own childhood right now, because as you improve that, you will then be more empathic of your children. Yes. So if it's easy, for for example, I one time punished one of my children. I saw he was supposed to be eating an apple or something, and he threw away most of it. And maybe he lied to me or something. I don't remember. And I, I lost it. <laughs> I got very angry at him. And sometime later, I realized, oh my God, this is a repetition of something that happened to me. So, if I had remembered that, Freud said, you remember, or you repeat, repetition compulsion. And uh, in in twelve step meetings, they say, you know, you repeat or you recover. So once you work on your own self, you'll have more compassion for your children. And that's what happened. And, you know, I started going to meetings, Al-Anon meetings, because of my husband. But my children said, you're so much nicer now since you've been going to those meetings. Mm -hmm. Because all my frustration was coming out, as I said, in my parenting, because of the problems in my marriage. So... Even I once observed a parent, they were at an ice cream store, and I think the child wanted a taste of the parent's ice cream cone or something. And the mother held it out and then pulled it away, and held it out and pulled it away. This child was probably about four or something. And in the parent's mind, it was just a game, but it was humiliating because it child is reaching out with a need, a want, and the parent is like taunting the child. So probably no one else would realize it, but but I had empathy for the child realizing what was going on. But that parent had never done the work on themselves, so they wouldn't be aware of that. Yeah, like you say, we cannot change what that that we don't know about, right? Our parenting will improve naturally, organically, as we work on ourselves and as we, and take care of ourselves in the present. 
That's, that's, that's no a- matter how much you know, if you're like overstressed, uh, don't have enough sleep or whatever, you're going to react. And kids are vulnerable to that. Yes. Well, that's and they're the very needy. That's- <laughs> they're very needy. Mm-hmm. that's the whole premise of the podcast and my work of authentic parenting finding your own authentic self connecting to your authentic self so that you can raise an authentic child you know i believe our children are already whole and complete and authentic but when we're disconnected from our own self it's hard to raise a child who is already becoming their own self it's hard to support that process that's right Mm-hmm. So let's talk about recovery. Is is there a full recovery possible, or it's a degree of recovery, or it's an ongoing process? Where does one begin the recovery process? Well, it starts with just gaining awareness. So learn all you can, read all you can. I would say go to twelve step meetings go to therapy and in terms of authenticity uh, one exercise I recommend is it's in the dummies book is at the end of the day uh, write down some conversations you've had ask yourself was I authentic did I say what I was feeling what I was thinking if not why not what stopped me and then write down what would be the authentic response. And the goal, I believe, is integration. Individuation, meaning you're a separate person from your family. That doesn't mean you don't see them, you could be close with them, but you have your own ideas, your own perceptions, your own values. They might be the same as your parents, but you've thought it through and you, you're owning them. You know, they, they work for you and your own feelings and needs separate from parents and other people. So there may be conflict marriages that where there's no conflict, like that old couple I described. Yes. It works because there's basically only one individual in the relationship. <laughs> the, the wife is totally accommodate, idealizing and accommodating the husband. So, uh, but if you have your separate, when you have conflict, that might be a higher stage of relationship because at least you're fighting for what you want and what you need. And then, in the dummies book, I have a, a scale of five stages and of a relationship and intimacy. And as you go up this scale and have more recovery, you can empathize with the other person. You can have your position. You can negotiate. You can accommodate. Sometimes you do what they want, but it's not unconscious. You're not sacrificing yourself. You're thinking, well, I can do that. I love this person. It's going to, this is a relationship, sir, two way street. So you're able to compromise. So you go from maybe being totally accommodating to then always fighting for your way to then being able to give and take, be interdependent and compromise. So, the other thing is that codependency recovery is, I mentioned, individuation and integration. So you want to be separate, individual from your family, but you also have to be integrated in yourself. And that means you have to know what your values are. You have to be aware of your feelings. You have to be aware of your needs. This takes, could take years. Yes. Especially know if what you were feeling like that, right? If, yeah. If, if it was completely, your needs were not met, your feelings were completely disregarded, dismissed. Like you said, it took you a while. You had this delayed response of, of anger. Um, it can take years to develop this um, th- the skill of, of learning about yourself and being in tune with your own inner world. Yes. So identifying it is mm-hmm. the first. 
then honoring it. So people identify and say, yeah, I shouldn't have gotten angry. I should get be over this by now. I should do this and that. They, they're constantly shitting on themselves, which I address in the ebook, 10 Steps to Self-Esteem. So there's the honoring it and then, and then expressing it. So there's different stages. I did a workshop. <clears throat> she recovers. And I was with a room with maybe about 40 women in recovery. And I asked them to do an exercise. This is kind of a preliminary to setting boundaries to write down what they, their rights that they feel entitled to. And then say, make a fist and say like, I have a right to my feelings. I have a right to respect. And it was interesting. Very few women could do this. Oh, wow. They would start giggling. They'd get embarrassed. They couldn't do it in all seriousness. They weren't used to like standing, owning their needs, their rights, and being able to with conviction. So how are you going to stop somebody from using or abusing or neglecting you if you don't feel you have a right to respect, if you don't feel you have a right to be taken seriously, if you don't feel that you matter? This comes back to shame. If you don't feel you matter, that's, there's, you feel inadequate. You don't feel lovable. That's the core problem. So integrating all of this and being in alignment with who you are, who you really are, not accommodating to somebody else, but getting in touch with this. My book is Conquering Shame and Codependency, Eight Steps to Freeing the True You. So you want to get connected to who you really are. And that could take years. And But you keep improving. You know, it doesn't mean it's not like you go from zero to 100 or that you don't see progress along the way. You do. And so usually you don't even realize it. Other people may notice you changed. <laughs> um, my my ex-husband would say, you've changed. He would say that like it's a manipulation. You're not the same, Darlene. You've changed. And I said, oh, thank you for noticing <laughs> I would not buy into that manipulation, you know. So, yeah, I wasn't like, you know, accommodating him on command. And so, eventually, I'll probably write a memoir about it all. But. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I would, I would be the first one to buy your memoir. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, setting boundaries, being assertive, saying no to people slowly, step by step, learning to do that. I mean, of course, it's not easy, but it's freeing and empowering for ourselves. I just want to mention that it will create, perhaps it will create emotions in other people, right? Especially, it will. right? It, because they were not used to it. Um, yeah. I have a section in the Dummies book called about backlash. Uh -huh. You know, it's much easier to set boundaries in a new relationship than change them in an existing one. So people who are thinking of moving in together or just married, now's the time to, you know, set down the rules of how you want to be treated. When I was first married, it was a shock to me that my husband expected me to pick up his clothes off the floor. So I said, like, are you kidding? Like, I'm not your maid. And he never did again. That was taken care of. The, the subtle emotional abuse I was manipulating, that, that I was not aware of. Because I was still unconscious about my, my worth and because of my upbringing. But... How you set the tone for relationship is very important. So when you want to change, then I started changing the rules. I said, that's abusive. Don't speak to me that way. Uh, he laughed. But he did. He started changing. He, he stopped doing some of what he was doing. So you can, but it's going to take a lot of support 
because you're going to get a lot of backlash. That's why therapy is important. The other thing is you grow up in a dysfunctional family and that's the planet you grew up on. People don't realize that everyone sees their life and other people, their world through the lens of their family that they grew up in. And the more you get individuated, I used to have a prayer to be every day. I would say, just please show me the true nature of reality. That was my prayer. And as long as you're caught up in the family, uh, enmeshed in your family system, whatever system that is, you see, you experience and perceive things through that lens. Different people react to different things in different ways, and that's because of how they were raised. So two people are going to see reality differently. But where was I going with this? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I forgot what I was saying. So... Boundary. Yes. So it's, it's just <laughs> because just because when we set boundaries and, and say no to people with more conviction and assertiveness, just because it may cause emotional reactions in them, uh, I, I just want to send this message to to the listener that do not stop being yourself and being more assertive because of that reason. Do not give up. So if you're in a relationship, that is. For some time, it's not working too well. That becomes your reality, and it's it's interwoven with your childhood reality. There's these layers of dysfunction. This is why it's important to not only see a, I'd say see a therapist and go to meetings because now you're in a functional family, like at a meeting. That's why there's no crosstalk. People don't give you advice. And there's a freedom to be yourself. And then in it, and people listen to you. And that in itself is healing, if nothing else. And that's a more functional environment. And then they living, they're in recovery, living by different principles of self-care and boundaries and self-respect and all these things. And so it's reminding you. So then you come back to your your marriage or your relationship and you say, wait a minute, this this feels... Now it doesn't feel so comfortable, and I see why. Then, But it's hard to change it. Then you go back to the meeting, and that gets reinforced, and you get more aware. And if you want to make changes, you're going to need behind you to support you, to encourage you, to keep on just as you're saying. Don't give up just because you're going to get resistance. Yes, yes. Yes. So it's just like training an animal. It's probably easier. I don't know a lot about dog training, but I imagine it's going to be easier to train a puppy than it is a dog that maybe was abused or had no training and it's an adult. And now you have to try to get it to change its behavior. So it's the same, but eventually you will if you keep at it. But if you, if you don't want the dog to beg at the table, for instance, and then you start feeding it at the table, you undermine the new rule. So you, it's very difficult in changing boundaries. You have to be persistent. You have to be consistent. And because the other person is going to try to dr- pull you back into the old ways by attacking you or undermining you with manipulation Wow. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, and before we say goodbye, as parting words, uh, as, someone oh. who, as someone who is listening to this and, and says, wow, I might be a codependent, uh, you know, someone who just gained a new level of awareness and is going to do some more reading and research about the topic. What, what would you say to that person? Well, the first thing I'd tell them to go to my website, which is whatiscodependency.com, and all my books are there. Some are in books. The paperbacks are in bookstores, and uh, all the books are also uh, digital, Amazon, and I have PDFs, eBooks that you can get on my website, and I blog frequently, 
You could spend hours reading up on my blogs and interviews, and there's some webinars there. <clears throat> so learn all you can. Attend Codependency Anonymous. And that's the first thing I would do. So get into recovery. Start therapy. Go to meetings. There's phone meetings if you can't find a meeting in your area. There's Al-Anon meetings, which saved my life. The mm -hmm. program's very similar to CODA. There's uh, adult children of al uh, sorry, adult children of alcoholic meetings. There's ACA meetings, which is adult children of alcoholics. One is within Al-Anon and the other is a separate program. So those are the first steps. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for your time, your presence and your wisdom and the content that you put out there in the world for free. And oh, it's cool. truly valuable. Thank you. And uh, I'll just also a reminder, I post every day on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. So uh, you can follow daily tips that way also. I will Thank have you all very the much. I will have all mm -hmm. the links to your social sites and I, I will follow myself. I didn't know you were on Instagram. That's where I hang out most of the time. Okay, good. And oh, since you're talking about parenting and authenticity, I should mention that I have a blog about six steps to authenticity and seven parenting essentials. Awesome. I have a blog on parenting and one on authenticity. Sounds fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And that's it for this episode of the Authentic Parenting Podcast. What is your number one key takeaway from this episode? Would you like to learn more about codependency? Do you know someone who might be in a codependent relationship? Darlene Lancer blogs extensively and she has so many free resources on her website. DarleneLancer.com and WhatIsCodependency.com. I highly encourage you connect with her on social media, follow her, and of course, subscribe to her newsletter. Join the Authentic Parenting community on Facebook and let's continue the conversation there. Also, follow me on Instagram, authentic.parenting.podcast. I am pretty active on there, and you can see some personal stories from me. Take a screenshot of this episode on your phone, share it on social media, and of course, tag me. Let's spread the word about the Authentic Parenting Podcast, and particularly this episode, as it might be helpful for others. For show notes, contact info, for working with me, and everything else, visit AuthenticParenting.com. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the show, rate, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And as always, connect to the present moment to yourself and your children. Until next week, I am Anna Seewald. Thank you so much for listening. Music